Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. We've been on a journey, family. On a journey to, let's call it refine our common sense. Part of that refinement or part of that fine tuning is having to do with our natural outlook. And we'll deal with that in another session. But the other part had to do with refining or fine tuning our spiritual eye. And that sharpening of our spiritual eye, that's the thing that gets us from being common to something more uncommon. When you think about it, in order to become an uncommon thinker, an uncommon person in the way you act, an uncommon person in the way you talk, an uncommon person in the way you perceive events, you or that individual in general, that individual has to have experiences with God. Experiences that let them know God is ever present, God is almighty, and that God has a vested interest in the outcome of their life. Amen. Such trust only comes through a one-on-one -on -one engagement with God. And that makes perfect sense. At least it should make perfect sense because how can any individual make the determination that the one and only true God is really their God if they never spend no quality time with him? The important part of simply spending time with God is that that builds up an assurance inside the person, an assurance that no matter what's going on, I know that life carries with it a God factor. And by a God factor, that is a knowing that no matter what I see before my natural eyes, my God is in control. In Jeremiah 32, verse 27, King James Version, God asked Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? When a person with an uncommon common sense gets asked a question like that, when a person gets asked, is there anything too hard for, for, for God that person with that kind of sense, that person has a direct and simple response. The response is no. There is nothing my God cannot do. It is that conviction, that conviction that God can do anything that undergirds a person's ability to stand firm and be patient and allow God to do stuff in God's pace and in his timing. Turn to Isaiah 40, verse 31 in the King James Version. A patient person waits on God, but waiting is an active posture. Say active. <laughs> Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Message Bible, same verse. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Waiting is a soaring and a running and a walking. It's, it's, it's active. It's doing something. It's not being stagnant. That's waiting on God. When you wait on God, there is a definite benefit. Because at the end of your waiting is a testimony. When you're done waiting on the Lord, there's a testimony at the end. And guess what? That testimony of yours, that testimony of mine has power. 
And why do we say that? Turn to Revelation 12, verse 11. King James Version. Your testimony has power. My testimony has power. No matter how big, no matter how small, it's your testimony. It's what God has done for you. It's what he's done in your life. It's what he's brought you through. Dag burn, it is a testimony and it has power. Own it. Possess it. Embrace it. Why do we say it has power? Revelation 12, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, meaning the Satan, meaning the enemy. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They overcame the enemy, Satan, the devil, not by the blood only, but they also overcame by the words about what God had done in the life of a believer coming out of the mouth of a believer. That tells me that even though I cannot be experienced with God for you, I can be an experience with God before you. My testimony has power. Your testimony has power. How rewarding it is to know that you and I can provide to another person strength, encouragement, motivation, direction, hope, all based on telling them what God has done for us. There are so many people in this world looking for where they should turn, looking for the answer in their life, searching for hope and you with your testimony toting self. <laughs> Got exactly what they need. The only thing missing in their life is for you to come in. If you don't mind, turn to Daniel 4. In Daniel 4, we're going to be coming out of the Message Bible. I'm going to jump in at verse 4. King Nebuchadnezzar is talking here. And he's getting ready to describe a dream. Verse four, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home <coughs> taking it easy in my palace without a care in the world. But as I was stretched out on my bed, I had a dream that scared me, a nightmare that shook me. I sent for all the wise men of Babylon so that they could interpret the dream for me. When they were all assembled, magicians, enchanters, fortune tellers, witches, I told them the dream. None could help me. None could tell me what it meant. Then Daniel came in. Remember last week we said that's, that's where you put your name in there. There are people in this world looking for answers. And, oh, they don't have an answer, but hold up. I just came in. Me and my God just came in. Me and everything that made the universe just came in. Yeah. Guess what? Your answer just arrived. Right. Me and my testimony. And then Daniel came in. His Babylonian name is Belteshazzar, named after my God, a man full of the divine Holy Spirit. I told him my dream. The king goes on to explain. He says, Belteshazzar, I said, chief of, mag of magicians, I know that you are a man full of the divine Holy Spirit and that there is no mystery that you can't solve. Listen to this dream that I have that I had and interpret it for me. This is what I saw. I was stretched out on my bed. I saw a big towering tree at the center of the world. Now, the king proceeds to go ahead and tell Daniel about his dream in full. And when he concluded his description, this is what he said to Daniel. Go down to verse 18. Verse 18 <clears throat> reads this way. This is what I, King Nebuchadnezzar, dreamed. It's your turn, Belteshazzar. Interpret it for me. None of the wise men of Babylon could make heads or tails of it, but I'm sure you can do it. 
you're full of the divine Holy Spirit. There will be times that people are searching for answers in the world and everywhere they turn with their worldly source will not get them an answer, but they will turn to you. Why? Because you are full of the, the divine Holy Spirit and ask you for the answer. Take comfort in knowing you, once again, and your testimony have all the answers they need. Now, Daniel goes on and he interprets this dream. Essentially, he says, listen, king, God is not happy with the way you are so self-absorbed in pride. And he's giving you a dream sort of as a warning in hopes that perhaps maybe you will change before he actually moves through with judgment. Ironically, king don't change. Even though he got the interpretation, he, like some of us, had to learn the hard way. This guy spent seven years of insanity until he finally came around, but eventually he came around. He made the decision to honor God, and in honoring God, God eventually restored him to his kingly position. We go through all of that to reveal this one item. Because all of that, the only thing that has context, that has meaning, that is a, a matter of consequence for what we're talking about in these sessions right now is that the king received the answer that he needed from the mouth of a believer who had experience with God. Your experience with God is your testimony. And that is not something that you should keep to yourself. Your testimony is beneficial to somebody. It's beneficial to someone. You should not keep that thing to yourself. I feel me. I feel that the testimony of believers is essential to other people in the world becoming acquainted with who God is and what God can do in their lives. In fact, I feel so strongly about it that I want to voice a concern. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor's getting ready to voice a concern. I want to voice a concern. And my concern is this. I believe we short-side ourselves in what we deem is a testimony. I believe that we draw such a narrow band around the context of what a testimony is that we miss the opportunities to be an effective witness. Here's what I want to do to help magnify what I'm talking about. I want to frame this thing for all of us. And I want to frame it, frame it using an analogy of a hospital waiting room. So I'm going to ask Mr. Frank and, and, and Mr. Mike, bring your chairs and sit, it up, sit them up here. You on that side, you on that side, and, and, and face. Yeah, let's go ahead and bring your chair up, too. Oh, you can bring chairs over there. I don't know where stuff at. <laughs> there are already chairs up there, right? They're like, Pastor, do we have to bring a chair up? Or can we get the chair that's already there? You may get the chair that's already there. I'm, I'm good with people telling me, have some sense. That works for me. I'm not that wound up. <laughs> Now, a hospital waiting room. Probably the most vivid example would be an emergency room. But any, whatever hospital waiting room comes to mind works, but the emergency room scenario is the one that probably brings the most light to what we're going to talk about. Now, recognize what we're doing is that we're drawing an analogy between a natural waiting room and you and I waiting on God. 
So essentially what we're saying is this is a comparison between a natural waiting room and God's waiting room. Now, here's the stereo. These two gentlemen come in the hospital for help. They give out their preliminaries. You know, you go to a little desk. Do I, do I care that it's called a triage? <laughs> Did y'all, was it confusing with desk? Desk was not confusing, was it? But for those who are medically inclined, I have it on sound, solid advice that is called a triage from this woman right here and from this woman right here. A triage. I'm not going to call it that, but it's, if you know the little desk that you go and do all your business at, you come in the triage. Educated up in here. So you come into, they come into triage and they do all of their stuff. They are now waiting. The fact that they're sitting there, let me ask you a question. Is the hospital still? They're still, but is the hospital still? The answer is no. From their vantage point, there is absolutely no movement in that hospital regarding getting them assistance for what they came in for as an issue. But rest assured, behind the scenes, behind the scenes, there, there are a multitude of people and processes working their names through the system and trying to get them just the help they need. The same thing happens when we're waiting on God. There are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we don't see. And all of those things are working us through the heavenly system, trying to move heaven and earth to get us what we need. But from our vantage point, there is nothing going on. Daniel 10, turn to Daniel chapter 10, gives us a snapshot of such a case. Now, this isn't always the case, but it gives us a good picture that behind the scenes, there's movement. Even though we don't view movement, it does not mean that there is nothing going on. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1 in the Message Bible. This is going to give us a good image of the behind-the-scenes spiritual activity going on. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, a message was made plain to Daniel, whose Babylonian name was Belteshazzar. The message was true. It dealt with a, big, with a big war. He understood the message, the understanding coming by revelation. During those days, I, Daniel, went into mourning over Jerusalem for three weeks. I ate only plain food. I ate only plain and simple food. No seasoning. Good Lord. I ate only plain and simple food. No seasoning or meat or wine. I neither bathed huh, nor shaved until three weeks were up. Listen, before we go on, let me tell you, at that particular time, I know he's the man of God, but I'm not standing downwind of this guy. Three weeks of no bathing. But you know what? He's doing what he felt he had to do. Go down to verse 11. Let's jump to the conclusion of this thing. In verse 11, the messenger of God is speaking to Daniel. The messenger says, it says, Daniel, he said, man of quality, listen carefully to my message and get up on your feet. Stand at attention. I've been sent to bring you news. When you had said this, I stood up. In other words, the messenger is talking to Daniel, and when he said he stood up, Daniel had previously fallen flat on his face, kind of out of, I don't know if you call it fear, or out of reverence of who he was, but now he's telling him, Daniel, stand up. I got something to tell you. 
Stand at attention. I've been sent to bring you, bring you news. When he had said this, I stood up. That's Daniel. But I was still shaking. Relax, Daniel, he continued. Don't be afraid. Listen to this. From the moment you decided to humble yourself to receive understanding, your prayer was heard and I set, set out to come to you. But I was waylaid by the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia and was delayed for a good three weeks. So the messenger of God took off three weeks ago in the spirit to get him the answer that he need. But he was delayed in the spirit three weeks. But then Michael, one of the chief angel princes, intervened to help me. I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia, and now I am here to help you understand what will eventually happen to your people. The vision has to do with what's ahead. So there is spiritual activity that we don't see. Let's get back to our hospital example, though. The two gentlemen sitting up here behind me in the waiting room. The scenario that we clearly view as a testimony worth saying, a testimony worth sharing, is this scenario. Now, assume that I was in the waiting room also, but now I'm leaving the hospital. I'm heading out. What's the value of me heading out? Well, you understand, I've seen the doctor. He or, she, he or she has taken care of my issue. He or she has come through for me. Spiritually speaking, I've already received my breakthrough. I have it. God has come through already for me. I'm no longer in the waiting room. I'm heading out. In my current position, I can look at both of these gentlemen and say, keep waiting on God. In my current position, I can tell them God is good. In my current position, I can tell them, you know what? God, he came through for me. In my current position, I can tell them my God is no respect to a person. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. In my current position, I can tell them to continue waiting on God. That is the testimony that people are quick to tell. That's the testimony that's easy to tell. That's the testimony that goes into the bucket of experiences with God. That's the testimony that we shout from the mountaintop. That's the testimony that we like to tell people. But... What about the other likely case? What about the likely case that they look up or they come in or somebody else walk in and they find me too in the waiting room, still waiting on God to come through for me? What about that scenario? What about the scenario now when I'm still waiting, when I'm still waiting? Do I still testify? What about the scenario? Let me ask you. While you are in the waiting room, do you still testify about God and how God, how good God is? Do you still testify when everything you see has no movement? Do you still testify when there are things happening behind the scenes that you can't see? Do you still testify about how God, how good God is when you're still in the waiting room? When you're still in the waiting room, do you still get a, that thought in your mind that God is going to come through? When you are in that scenario and you don't have your breakthrough, you don't have your healing. You're not possessing the promise. Is your tongue still quick 
to shout about God and his goodness. Let me tell you this. I don't know about you. I don't know what you do. But I can tell you what I do. I still testify. Yes, sir. You should still testify. Regardless of what's going on, you should always tell people about the goodness of God. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about testimonies, let me tell you this. Sometimes the description of your waiting is more powerful to others who are also waiting. Sometimes the most powerful thing that you can tell somebody is, hey, listen, I ain't got it all together right now, but I'm waiting on God. You know what? My husband still trips sometimes, but I'm waiting on God. My wife still get on my nerves, but I'm waiting on God. My lights just got turned off, but I still wait on God. I'm still waiting on him. No matter what's going on in my life, I'm still waiting. Why? Because I want to be an uncommon believer. Sometimes the best thing that you can tell somebody is that this is the way I am right now, but I'm still waiting. Remember that waiting is not a posture of doing nothing. So the message to a person who's also waiting is, hey, listen, if you need some confidence and support while you having to wait, just keep your eyes on me. Because I'm going to keep doing what I have to do until I see what God said was going to be. Amen. That means if I need to pray, I'm going to pray. If I need to run, I'm going to run. If I need to pause, I'm going to pause. If I need to shout, I'm going to shout. If I need to fight, I'm going to fight. I'm going to keep on doing in my waiting what I need to do to see God come through. If you need confidence in your waiting, just look over at me. Whatever it means for me to stay in line with what his will is for my life. That is what you are going to find me doing. If you need encouragement. While you sitting in the waiting room. Simply look across the room at me. And observe me. Observe my character. Observe my attitude. Observe how I'm talking. Observe how I'm walking. Observe how I'm treating other people. Observe, observe me if you need encouragement in your waiting. You can observe my resolve. You can observe how I just won't quit. You can observe how I just won't give up. Listen, if you need encouragement while you're in your waiting, just look over and observe me in my waiting. Because in my waiting for my breakthrough, I still have a testimony to share. And that testimony is called my waiting. While we are all sitting in this waiting room together. He may need some encouragement. And while I'm waiting. The simple fact that I'm waiting is unto God gives him the strength that he needs to keep waiting himself. If I get weak in my waiting, but I can look across and see a fellow believer who's waiting on God, who's receiving strength, who's mounting up on wings as eagles, who's running and not getting weary, who's walking and not getting tired, who's not getting faint. You know what I can do? I can say I can do it, too. Why? Because your final end, what we call our testimony, is not the only thing you have to share as a testimony. You have a testimony and your testimony is in your waiting.
we refuse to hold our mouths quiet on our testimony until we get to the finish line. We refuse to let the only time we celebrate God be when we're holding on to the prize. We refuse to let the only time we lift up our hands in honor to God be when we're finally at our breakthrough. We refuse to be those people that look past all the things that God is doing for us on the way to where we got to go. Our waiting is very much part of our testimony. We are going to testify about God right where we are. You know, people say things to people that are in the waiting room. People tend to say things to people who are, you know, going through a situation, waiting on God. These two gentlemen here are still in the waiting room. People would say certain things to them. Often, the kind of things I hear is, are, are, are things like, you know what? When God gets through with you, <laughs> you're going to have a wonderful testimony. Yes. Now, that's, that statement sounds very safe, doesn't it? Fairly benign, pretty harmless. And I agree that the, the intent is, is that the intent is well placed. But that kind of statement can put the focus on the end yeah. and cause the person to lose sight of all the things that God is doing for them in the process yeah. of getting yeah. to the end. Right. When I hear those kind of statements, it bothers me because our testimonies before others are not just us making it to our successful end. The journal of our footsteps that got us to the end, that journal is just as important, if not more, in our testimony as actually getting there. When we talk about getting there, we can find it easy to shout at the end. You know, when you got the victory, when you got your prize, when you cross the finish line, we can find it easy to shout then. But that final outcome, that is not your only testimony. Family, your waiting is your testimony too. Your waiting is just as much part of your testimony as holding up the trophy at the end. Now, there are other times, and since we have these two gentlemen still waiting, let's go ahead and use them for this too. There are other times where people's comments aren't as kind as the previous one. They can be sometimes quite cruel. Yeah. They see you being faithful to God. They know what you're believing for because you, you told them. They see you're still waiting, though. So what did they say? You still serving God? When, 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 are, when are you going to finally get this testimony? You've been telling me a long time that you got this testimony coming. When, when are we going to finally see it? The issue is that they never know, and maybe some of you never knew until today, that when you're talking about where is my testimony, you must be blind in the eye because, baby, my waiting is my testimony. The testimony is not standing at the end in the, in the finished block, is the, the, the finish line. 
Waiting is also my testimony. Now, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about something. In talking about waiting, think about all the people in the Bible who have great testimonies of waiting. Paul, for example. Paul has a great testimony of waiting. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul describes a personal situation or condition that he initially saw as a negative regarding his unanswered prayer. We're going to be in verse 6. You see, Paul's focus was on his end game, the end goal. His focus was on the relief. And I believe that the simple fact that Paul was so focused on his relief that his view of what God could do in between started to get a little dim. The King James Version calls Paul's personal issue a thorn in the flesh. The Message Bible refers to it as a handicap. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what you call it. The bottom line is that God told his boy to push on because my grace is all you need. My grace is enough. It's all you need. The King James Version said it like this. Boy, my grace is sufficient. Verse 6, if I had a mind to brag a little, I could probably do it without looking ridiculous, and I'd still be speaking plain truth all the way. But I'll spare you. I don't want anyone imagining me as anything other than the fool you'd encounter if you saw me on the street or heard me talk. Because of the extravagance of those relations, of those revelations, and so I won't get a big head, I was given a gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that. And then he told me my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was the case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. To this day, Paul's testimony of waiting gives people encouragement who may be working with an affliction, who may be working with some personal issue, who may be working on something that's working with something that's tough. It gives them a testimony and encouragement to keep pressing on with God. So if that's the waiting room you're in, be encouraged. Abraham, who we talked about in detail, so we don't have to talk about him much anymore. Abraham illustrated a, a testimony of God delivering on his promise. One, one attribute of, of waiting with Abraham was waiting for 25 years for his wife to conceive and give birth to a son. And you know what? God came through. So if that's the waiting room you're in, if you've been waiting a while for God to come through, if it's been looking like perhaps there is no movement or no activity resolving your issue, know that there's movement behind the scenes and take a testimony from Abraham. God will come through. Amen. Jesus. Jesus had a testimony. But when we think about Jesus, a lot of times what we think about is the crucifixion and the resurrection. But family, the testimony of Jesus was not limited to that one little slice of time. His testimony 
covered a lifetime. Turn with me to Hebrews 4. Amplified classic, starting in verse 14. Jesus produced probably what's history's most monumental testimony of waiting. Verse 14, inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession of, his, of faith in him. Listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability and liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. That's a testimony. Let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and will time help coming just when we need it. Jesus was tempted in this life with sin, but he sinned not. That is a, just about nearly a, around a 33 year period of a testimony in waiting from birth to the cross. That's his whole story, not just the cross. When I think about that testimony in waiting, I'm really happy that Jesus' story was told in full. I would hate for the gospel of Jesus Christ to just read and Jesus rose on the third day. You see, if you skip out the process, you minimize the power of the testimony. In thinking about Jesus, go to Revelation 12, back there, verse 11, King James Version. In thinking about Jesus and what he did on, you know, what people refer to as that old rugged cross. In thinking about that, I don't want any of us to ever lose sight of, as believers, we do have an ultimate goal. We do have an ultimate goal of, of, of ultimately getting to heaven and seeing Jesus face to face. And all that we do down here on earth and everything that we search for and all of our breakthroughs, behind the scenes of all that is an ultimate goal. Once again, Revelation 12, 11 reads, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I believe somewhere in heaven. Probably some, you know, supplemental documents to that lamb book of life. I believe somewhere in heaven. That the testimonies of you and I and our testimonies are being written down. And what's being written down about us is not we are in heaven. Catch that. What's being written about us as a testimony in heaven is not about we are in heaven. It's about everything that we did on our way there. It's about how we treated people. It's about how we talk to people. The testimonies about us in heaven is about our waiting. Every time we mounted up with wings as eagles and we began soaring, heaven took note. Every time we began to run and not get weary, heaven took note. Every time we walked and we didn't faint, heaven took note. What's written about us in heaven as a testimony is our waiting. Not the fact that we got there. There are words being written about us in heaven. But they are words about how we did what we did to get to where we got to doing what we were designed to do. On our way to heaven. 
So the next time the Spirit of God moves you to help somebody, when you are done helping with whatever you're helping them with, just go off to the side and say to yourself, oh, there go another testimony. You do something good out of your, the loving goodness of your heart for your mama, just when you get in your car to go home, just say, ooh, there go another testimony. As a matter of fact, getting testimonies may become so infectious to you, you may ultimately become one big walking testimony. You may be at the job. People are like, what's going on with you? You acting a little different. You talking a little different. What's, what's, your family started talking to you. I, I noticed something different about you. You are more helpful than you usually are. You just seem to be doing things a little different. You just tell them, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm just waiting. This is what waiting looks like. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm building my testimony on my way to my testimony. Once again, in closing, family, Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death, unto the death. That testimony that we're talking about celebrating is not just about our breakthrough. It is also about all the things that God helped us accomplish on our way to breaking through. A few of you, I know, I know people like this. A few of you may be thinking, you know, I've never really verbalized my testimony to anybody. And you may think that you haven't really told your testimony to anybody, but if you've been obedient to God, other people have been watching. And through their observation and you waiting, you have told them a lot. Now, does that mean that we should not verbalize our testimonies now that, you know, people can see them? <laughs> of course not. Always open your mouth and let your story testify. Always be willing to vocalize to somebody what God has done for you. When you open your mouth and you testify, it encourages other people, and that's a good thing. What we're asking is this, that you recognize that your testimony is not limited to you just standing at the finish line. That your waiting is a testimony that has power and that gives encouragement to other people as well. Say this with me. My waiting, My waiting is, a is a testimony also. also. And we'll catch you next week. Let's pray. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.